Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. When I was doing my PhD, I was studying brainwave patterns in people with dementia. And I was trying to do differential diagnosis very early on in the course of cognitive decline, seeing which type of dementia did they have. Was it frontal lobe dementia? Was it Lewy body dementia? Was it Alzheimer's dementia? And I was failing miserably for two years. I was getting nothing. I used to go home. I was living in this doctor's residence and I had this sort of, in the middle of my room, this little igloo of journals that used to sit in on a Sunday, just this kind of like sort of sanctified circle of, of knowledge. And I was reading one Sunday and I realized that the different pathologies in these different dementias, some would hit the sleep centers and others would leave those sleep centers completely untouched. Even within forms of dementia that clinically presented very similarly. That's right, yeah. You could see certain brainstem nuclei, certain centers within the basic base of the brain. Some of those were getting eroded by the dementia and those are sleep generating centers. Whilst in other of those pathologies, those centers were spurred until very late in the disorder. So they probably weren't affecting my early patients. So I realized I was measuring their brainwave activity at the wrong time. I was measuring my patients whilst they were awake. What I should have been doing is measuring them whilst they were asleep, got a small grant, set up a sleep lab, learned how to do it, got some great results. And then the question became, if their sleep is so disrupted, is it not just a symptom of de dementia? Could sleep disruption actually be a biomarker of dementia? Could it actually foretell when you are going to develop dementia and which type? Or even more profound, is sleep disruption an underlying cause of Alzheimer's disease? And I think right now, based on the weight of the data that we have, and we and others have got large research programs doing this work, the evidence I think is causal. I think that sleep at this stage may be one of the most significant lifestyle factors, at least, that determines your risk ratio for Alzheimer's disease. I, I feel the causal evidence for that now in humans and animals is strong enough to make that statement. And I don't make that statement lightly. Yeah, that is profound because when you think about the other really big ones, vascular disease and insulin resistance, they both feed into a very similar mechanism, which is neuronal energy deprivation. That's right. So do you think that sleep disruption or poor sleep, and I want to come back to the semantics around that because I don't actually think I'm well equipped to talk about this intelligently, but do you think that that also disrupts some aspect of energy metabolism in the brain or where in the sort of chain of events do you think that that impacts I think one of the places that it impacts is in oxidative stress. I think it's safe to say that wakefulness is low level brain damage and we need sleep to avert some of that low level brain damage that wakeful sleep is the price that we pay for wakefulness <laughs> essentially. In the book, you know, I proposed that we didn't evolve sleep that perhaps we've got it the wrong way around. Perhaps the default state of life on the planet was sleep. And it was from sleep that wakefulness emerged. Wow. Why could it not have been that way? Now, I don't have any good evidence to support my hypothesis. I think it could be utter nonsense. But I think it's a tenable hypothesis. It's just one that's difficult to test. But to come back to your question about Alzheimer's, which I think is critical, I think the first thing is that we see that with insufficient sleep, you get increases in oxidative stress. Those oxidative stress processes lead to a whole cascade of kind of a finger flick domino effect of things that lead to neuronal death. One of the areas in the brain that is most sensitive to that is an area that we call the hippocampus, which is a critical memory center. It's probably one of the first structures to undergo damage in Alzheimer's disease. It's part of the reason why the sort of the phenotype of Alzheimer's is forgetfulness, problems with memory. I think perhaps the stronger evidence though, in terms of sleep and Alzheimer's disease risk is a remarkable discovery that was made probably about five or six years ago now by some folks at Rochester University in rats. And what they discovered is that the brain actually has 
a sewage system inside of it. Now, your body has one that you're all familiar with called the lymphatic system. But it turns out the brain has one. And it's called the glymphatic system, named after the cells in the brain that form this system called the glial cells, also known by sort of from a Greek derivative meaning glue. So they used to be just thought as the the sort of the cells. The sort that, of irrelevant stuff between the neurons. <laughs> exactly, you know. Yeah, it was like junk DNA. And of course, what we always learn is that Mother Nature is far too efficient to leave inefficiency on the table, like glue or junk. And it turns out they form uh, this sanitization system within the brain. And what happens, they discovered, is that when you go into deep sleep at night, this sewage system kicks into high gear. And essentially, those glial cells which surround the brain cells themselves, the neurons proper, they shrink in size by up to 200%. And then all of a sudden it leaves a vast amount of room for cerebrospinal fluid to start perfusing the brain and washing out the, detri the metabolic detritus of wakefulness. So it would be like New York City at night, all of the buildings shrunk down to 200%. You know, they became miniaturized. And then there was this big effluent flush that just happened across Manhattan to clear out all the debris. And it's essentially good night, sleep clean, that you get this power cleanse at night. Why is this related to Alzheimer's? Well, one of the critical ingredients that they found that the glymphatic system washed away was a sticky toxic protein called beta amyloid. Beta amyloid is probably one of the two core proteins that we know underlie your risk for the development of Alzheimer's. Ergo, if you're not getting your sleep at night, you're not getting that washing away of the toxic Alzheimer's protein. Every night, then, you are building up more amyloid within the brain. If you keep doing that night after night, it's like compounding interest on a loan. It's just escalating your Alzheimer's risk. That's why we can then explain the associational evidence, which I, I don't like associational evidence in epidemiological studies, and I don't think you're a huge fan of it, perhaps, either. Just um, don't tell anybody at the Harvard School of Public Health. Yeah, or maybe the NIH when I'm applying for grants for epidemiological studies. But what we certainly see is that if you bucket people into the amount of sleep on average that they've got across the lifespan, and at the end of the sort of life or in late life in their 70s and their 80s, we do a special type of PET scan to map the amount of amyloid in their brain. And then you just sort of look at those brain scans. Anyone on the street would not need any statistics. They would not need any training in brain science to see that one of these maps is different to the other. It's like Sesame Street. And what is remarkable is people who are getting, you know, seven hours of sleep or less compared to seven hours of sleep or more, there is marked differences in the amount of amyloid that's built up. Now that's just associational evidence. But then when you take it down to the level of animal studies, where they selectively deprive animals of either deep non-REM sleep or they fragment their sleep, you get an immediate amyloid buildup centrally within the brain. You start to have what looks like a sort of, you know, an amyloid sort of genic process that's happening. That's rats. So then we can all wave our hands if we want because we would like to beat our chests and sort of, you know, say, I don't need my sleep and that's just rat stuff. Well, the studies have now been done in humans where we will take a human being and for one single night, we will take away their deep sleep. And the way that you do that is that you just play these auditory tones at night. So they never wake up. So the total amount of sleep that they get is still eight hours, but I can just selectively excise your deep sleep when that, that sewage system should be kicking into gear. And then the next day we do something that's really rather unpleasant. We do a spinal cord puncture and we suck out some cerebrospinal fluid and we can measure the amount of the two toxic proteins linked to Alzheimer's. One is called beta amyloid that we've discussed. The other is called tau protein. And we see the next day after one night of sleep disruption, a significant increase in circulating levels of amyloid and tau. For me, that was kind of like the turning point where I finally felt comfortable going on record and saying, at this point, folks, I really feel comfortable saying that your sleep is a critical component of your prevention of Alzheimer's disease. I really think it, the, the evidence is now 
you know, in that direction and way in that direction. It's not just epidemiological. It's not just prospective longitudinal studies, which are better than cross-sectional sort of epidemiological. It's not just causal in rats. It's experimentally causal in humans after one night of sleep. (laughs) 